And hey everyone, welcome back to our coverage here in Ethnic Politics. This week is going to be another great one. We are attacking head-on neoliberalism as a socioeconomic and to a lesser degree, but no less problematic, a sociocultural standpoint in hegemonic American political thinking. Um, the title of this lecture is aptly called The Neoliberal Assault on Social Democracy and Public Health. Um, you know, we're more than a year into the COVID pandemic. Um, things are no longer fun, as everyone can agree. Uh, we have witnessed um, effectively the weaknesses, the shortcomings, the failings of the American public health system. Um, we also note over the past couple of months, not over the last year or so, a number of our elected officials um, unapologetically and unironically saying that the health of the economy is more important than the health of your loved ones. We have witnessed numerous um, social gatherings in which people will willingly um, not wear masks, thinking that um, this is a direct assault on their personal freedoms and liberties. We have heard politicians say if people get sick, they get sick. Um, we have also uh, heard uh, multiple stories um, about uh, companies like Amazon, which has uh, increased its profit margins by just ridiculous amounts uh, over the past 12 months. But at what cost? Um, Amazon workers are kind of the modern-day equivalent to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory garment workers. Um, people who are driving um, these uh, shuttle vans, delivering uh, up to 200 packages a day uh, without any adequate break time, time to eat, uh, even use the restroom, um, and hearing stories about the conditions of workers, uh, either in the, you know, the, the distribution centers or driving the shuttles around or in other companies that are similar to that, um, that are just downright draconian. I mean, just right out of, um, you know, a, a tale of two cities in that sense. And I think the worst part about all of this is the sad realization that there's a large amount of the American electorate that seems to support this system because any changes... Um, any kind of reinstatement of state authority and regulation, um, any considerations of uh, public health care or an expansion of the social welfare system is a direct attack on American values of freedom, liberty, and individuality. Um, and the, the worst part about it is, is that there is a vast amount of individuals who would benefit from these changes, but yet feel that they would rather continue the status quo, knowing that they are hurting themselves physically, mentally, psychologically, um, because it inconveniences and doesn't give any kind of um, handouts to these allegedly lazy immigrants or um, you know minority moochers that uh, hardworking Americans like themselves uh, are putting their toil and sweat into. So this is kind of the, you know, the paradox of American political culture that we've been you know, basically examining for the last uh, two to three weeks. You know, why do white people make these ridiculous, asinine um, opinions? Why do they vote for political parties that, um, you know, openly, um, you know, disenfranchise, disempower and uh, uh, demobilize all of them? And, uh, you know, how is it that there really doesn't seem to be outside of a few, you know, progressive left-wing individuals like, you know, Bernie Sanders and, or, um, you know, Rashida Tlaib, that uh, there really doesn't seem to be a bigger push within the American, um, you know, political circle to rectify these problems. Why is it that we constantly hear about, um, you know, deregulated environmental protection laws that suddenly contaminate the water supply system of an entire town um, or just, you know, toxifies the, um, the animal plant and sea life, uh, which we draw uh, food from. Why is it that, um, you know, even now, a year into the COVID pandemic, um, we see spikes in COVID-related cases, uh, most notably uh, in Michigan this morning um, among school children. And, you know, this push to reopen schools, even though there is still um, an acute sense of 
uh, risks of getting the pandemic from being exposed to people around you. And why is it that public health just seems to be deteriorating every single year? The quality of life just seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, and, you know, those that claim to, you know, speak on behalf of the system and at least rhetorically give sympathy to the people who are victimized by the system do nothing to change the system, but in many situations uphold the apparent sacrosanctity, if that's even a word, of neoliberalism, a policy which I will use in this lecture to say has had disastrous um, effects on the quality of life, um, economic security, and the public health of millions and millions of Americans. So, you know, this conversation today, which unfortunately is not going to be any more um, optimistic than the previous ones. In fact, they'll probably be even more disappointing. I'm sorry to, you know, constantly be the buzzkill in this class. Um, I think it's rather important. It focuses on, uh, you know, once again, contemporary events and current problems. But I think it finally gets to one of the main core reasons for why things are as problematic um, as they are. So, you know, this uh, long-winded introduction is really by way of segueing into noting the continued discussions of things and topics that we've been um, examining over the past couple of weeks. Um, chief of which is really what this course is designed around, an examination of the relationship between collective group identity and political decision making, right? So how does group identity within regional, political, cultural, ethnic groups shape, define, and orient their decision making within politics, right? Why do people vote for the things that they vote for, uphold and defend the things that they uphold and defend, um, oppose the things that they oppose. Um, so this adds to the discussion, but it brings in um, a rather unique element, something that Henry Giraud uh, writes extensively about, um, both in the assigned readings for this week as well as his other works, and that is the politics of disposability. Um, this is sort of the, the byproduct of neoliberalism, is that it creates disposable societies, um, either by regional community, by socioeconomic class, or even by generation, right? He, he does, um, in another book, Youth in a Suspect Society, talk about um, this notion of disposable youth, people that are seen to be um, just simply exploitable products of free market fundamentalism. And, you know, having little more than just simply being um, consumers in a market-driven economy is really all that these disposable uh, societies are expected to be um, for the sake of upholding um, a very, um, you know, unequal, um, non-egalitarian socioeconomic society that empowers um, and enriches a very small percentage of the population at the direct expense of everyone else. And so with all of that in mind, we will also continue our examination of the narratives of dominant and subordinate social groups, right? So drawing from um, the, you know, the public and private transcripts uh, of James C. Scott's work, um, but also examining the collective narratives that um, different socioeconomic uh, and socioethnic groups um, you know, possess. Um, the nihilism, uh, particularly uh, within black America, but also among, you know, euphemistically brown America, the Asian uh, Americans, the Muslim communities, the Latino communities, the sense that um, people of color are largely overlooked, exploited, and in some cases even directly targeted uh, by the practices of neoliberalism. And then to that, we look at the self-inflicted sadism of the great backlash among white communities, right? Specifically, um, lower middle to working class poor communities, right? So this is very uh, much a continuation of our discussion of Thomas Frank's book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, but the thing to note here is that, you know, poor whites are specifically targeted by this system to enrage them against the system, but by dividing them and differentiating them from uh, poor people of color who are made to believe are out to take white people's jobs. 
Um, so in a way, this divide and conquer and radicalization of the most exploited and the least advantageous um, leads to uh, the ongoing culture wars in a, you know, in, in a larger institutional problem that is um, economic. But we deflect our attention away from the economics uh, by turning it into politics of cultural identity, right? And so with, you know, with all of that said, we are going to be adding some new questions uh, to the discussion this week. Um, with our um, specific examination of neoliberalism. And the first question to note is, how have the policies of neoliberalism undermined the foundations of civic and social democracy in America and led to the atomization of the public? And this is you know, very important to note here, the atomization, the individualization of the public. Um, how has the um, attack on democratic virtues, the understanding of civic collective activity, um, and the effectively, you know, effectively the atomization of group um, collective action. How is this all connected to the deterioration of infrastructure, social welfare, and public health in America, right? All three are clear indicators that the quality of life in the United States has deteriorated significantly since the 1980s, right? We see this in our crumbling infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our buildings, um, the virtual elimination of social welfare, right? The reduction in um, unemployment benefits, the, the shortening of time that one can be on unemployment, um, the continued um, debate over whether $15 is um, you know, an adequate minimum federal wage this time, or whether $7.25 still serves as just a good enough incentive for you to stop flipping burgers and you know, go and learn how to code or something like that, right? And then when it comes to public health, I mean, you know, here's the real sad reality. The United States is, and you know, if you're a fan of Bernie Sanders, you know exactly what, he's, what he means here. We're the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care as a human right. I mean, every other developed democracy, and in some cases even developing states, consider health care to be just part of what citizens should enjoy, right? You don't have to worry about going bankrupt if you get sick in most other developed countries. And you hear these stories in the United States about how, you know, this little kid decides that he's going to, um, I don't know, sell lemonade or um, uh, pay for, uh, to, to pay for some medical bills that his, uh, you know, parents need. Or, you know, this one kid is going to pay for everyone's school lunch because lunch debt is something that we have in this country. Uh, you know, you, you want to talk about um, people in other countries, you know, trying to tell you about how bad things are in the United States. I mean, lunch debt, little kids not being able to get an adequate meal at school because they don't have the money to pay for it. I mean, this is kind of one of the problems, one of the major problems of neoliberalism in which economics is put above social welfare and social well-being. So how have the politics of neoliberalism connected to the deterioration in this country's infrastructure, its social welfare, and its public health? Considering that proponents of neoliberalism will want you to believe that they are, that, that it is a direct um, contributor to all three of these, right? I mean, you know, the, the theorists that we're going to get to, I mean, couldn't be more wrong if they tried. And, you know, to that, one final follow-up question before we jump into the actual material. How has the withdrawal of the state contributed to the radicalization of political culture and the disastrous rise in mortality rates among working and lower classes? Right? So one of the big um, beliefs, one of the big tenets of neoliberalism is that the state should take less of an active role in promoting social welfare, right? The state is seen as more of an obstacle than a catalyst for the improvement in life. And if you're wondering how is this even possible, again, just a lot of these things you just kind of need to take on faith. We'll you know, go through it piece by piece here. But if the state has now relinquished its 
responsibility, right? And the best way of doing that is just simply cutting taxes, cutting services, cutting funding to things that were previously considered uh, public accessible goods and services um, in favor of austerity measures, right? How have these austerity measures and the subsequent defunding of public health disenfranchised minorities and radicalized whites, right? So why is it that some of the poorest white communities tend to be the most actively involved in preventing uh, voting against any notions, right, of public health care, public welfare, um, you know, public goods, because that's seen as socialist and altogether un-American, in fact, even anti-American. And why, while we're on the subject of whites, why do white Americans continue to fundamentally support political parties and specifically leaders that actively, unapologetically, and unironically advocate for policies that ultimately kill them. You know, I mean, you know, deregulation of gun safety laws, uh, rolling back of environmental protection policies, um, which you know also includes um, you know re you know reducing the um, standards in clean air and drinking water and. Um, food qualities. Um, we're talking also about defunding education, defunding public service, all these things which, you know, effectively benefit, um, you know, average working Americans. Um, why is it that the people that are the most disenfranchised, as we talked about last week, um, why do they continue to support these policies? I mean, what's the story? What's the explanation behind that? So to examine all of this, right, the readings for this week, um, it, you know, consist of one chapter of Henry Giraud's 2017 work, America at War with Itself. And it specifically looks at uh, the catastrophic consequences of, you know, state funding being pulled, economic policies and environmental issues being deregulated in the city of Flint which led to, um, you know, not the water just becoming contaminated, but literally toxic, fatal to drink, let alone even touch. And along that, we are going to be looking at the introduction and the conclusion to Joseph Metzl's 2019 work, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland, right? In, a, in, in you know, in short order here, the, the book asks, why is it that so many economically impoverished white Americans are willing to forego universal health care, um, re-regulating of gun safety laws, um, and increased taxes uh, that would altogether better their own lives. Why would they be all supporting their elimination? Um, and why would they be putting their own sense of traditional cultural values, which mean nothing in the grand scheme of things, above these institutional and socioeconomic fail-safes, right? So there's lots of things for us to examine uh, in the next hour and change. Uh, we are going to begin with looking at, finally, the theories of neoliberalism itself, right? And this is a term that I'm sure you've heard before. If you've had a class with me, you know I rail against it all the time. Um, but oftentimes, neoliberalism is sort of meant in an argument without explaining it to the listener. And Suffice to say, right, neoliberalism is the prevailing hegemonic um, political and economic policy that has shaped and directed this country for the last 40 years. Right? It really begins sometime around 1980, 1981 with the inauguration of Ronald Reagan. Um, it has come under increasing criticism over the past couple of years, uh, specifically by the populist right and left. But both sides attack neoliberalism for two completely different reasons. The left, and this is the, you know, the Bernie Sanders, the um, Democratic Socialists, uh, the more, you know, lefty left people, will attack neoliberalism effectively for its economic policies, its horribly mis- um, mangled economic policies that impoverish more people than it enriches. The right, on the other hand, will attack neoliberalism more for its sociocultural attributes, 
um, particularly those that advocate for policies of integration, uh, diversity, inclusion, cosmopolitanism, you know, the, the same type of secular progressivism that uh, we talked about last week and the week before. Um, this isn't necessarily part of neoliberalism, at least its initial theories, but it's a nice way of making neoliberalism's um, emphasis on individual empowerment um, and a sense of self-improvement and self-worth um, be more convincing to an otherwise skeptical audience. And you know, we'll, we'll get to all of that you know, in, you know, in time. But suffice to say right now, right, the theories of neoliberalism are as follows. Right? These are the beliefs. First and foremost is the acceptance of free market fundamentalism. This is the primary element of neoliberalism. Free market fundamentalism in which social problems become privatized and removed from public debate. So social problems like, you know, economic, um, you know, blight, um, financial hardship, um, urban decay, um, problems with schools, um, public health. These things used to be, or at least still in theory should be, things that the state, either national or local governments, you know, should address, at least within a democratic framework. Within neoliberalism, all of these things become privatized, right? They become problems that either A, are to be solved by private companies and marketing firms, or B, just by individual self-help. But what this does is it alleviates the responsibility of the individual to worry about the problems of people outside of one's immediate family. So we don't need to worry anymore about the institutional problems of education. What I can do as an advocate of neoliberalism is either A, go for private tutoring to augment the problematic education that I get, or B, pull my kid out of public school and put them in a charter school, a private school, homeschool them, whatever. Problem solved. I took advantage of a situation. I made good on it. This is individual self-worth. And this leads to the second point. The principles of communal responsibility, right? The health of the entire town is more important than the individual has now been reversed, right? It has now been reversed and replaced with emphases on individual happiness. So public health, working institutions, um, standards in public housing, environmental regulations, clean water, whatever it is you want to call it, right? These things are still important, but they're no longer the concern of the citizenry. What your concern is, is really act, you know, acquiring you know, material goods, right? Um, you know, individual happiness is now measured through the acquisition of public goods and services. So it's a form of consumerism, which is not surprising if neoliberalism emphasizes the importance of the free market. In other words, go out and buy something. All right, purchase something that is either going to increase your productivity um, or just reward yourself with the hard work that you've done. You know, a little retail therapy, a little cathartic gift to yourself uh, will certainly alleviate, you know, most of your concerns, anxieties, and problems. So this leads to the third tenet of neoliberalism, which is the belief that the free market alone should provide for the welfare of society. Now, here is where things become incredibly problematic because the word belief is one that neolibs really, and I mean really, stick to, okay? It's the belief, almost a naive belief, almost the sense of, I have to believe that the free market will provide for the welfare of society. What this means is that the free market now takes on the responsibility of something that the state previously had a monopoly in handling, right? The withdrawal of the state in place of corporate sovereignty means, and again, we're still being abstract theoretical, that problems in health, infrastructure, environment, um, education, public works, roads, housing, these things should really now be in the hands of private enterprise, 
right? People who think creatively can compete with one another, um, you know, and will allow the, you know, the customer to, you know, bid for one group or another, you know, again, in a, in, in a theoretical conceptual sense here, right? You know, entrepreneurs for, let's say, education, you know, private education, is going, you know, they're going to compete with each other for where parents are going to send their kids to school for. And that means that the quality of education should be good. The you know, standardization in teaching and, you know, creativity is going to be much better than the bland um, sort of, um, you know, catering to the lowest common denominator um, policies that allegedly exist within public schools. So the state kind of yields sovereignty to corporate interests. Right? The state will basically privatize uh, many of its previous responsibilities to unelectable and ultimately unassailable individuals who we just have to believe have the best interests of the public in mind. Right? Again, just, <laughs> just follow me on this. Right? And so in that sense, the final theory of neoliberalism, if we take all of this as is, is that identity and value are now designed through a customized set of market solutions and segmentations. Hence the reason why in the United States, right, there is, you know, this, this, this explosion in, you know, the self-help market, um, you know, in, in, in individualized health, um, you know, we have competing auto insurance companies, Health insurance company. Health insurance companies tend to be much more omnipresent than anything else. You know, the auto insurance companies this is a great example of neoliberalism. I mean, someone comes up with the idea that uh, you need to pay money into this third-party group to effectively cover the expenses of your car in case you get hit, right? And, you know, it kind of makes sense. Someone hits you, you don't pay a dime. You know, you are paying every year into this insurance pocket, uh, but the insurance company of the other guy will pay for your repair if he hits you, right? And, you know, and vice versa. Um, and because there are so many of these auto insurance companies, right, you see them on TV, right, they compete with each other, they got their own little mascot, they got their own little gimmick, you know, you got the Geico Gecko, you got Flow from Progressive, you got the guy, are you in good hands for Allstate, right, you know, and they become kind of like, you know, consumer figures that we all, you know, recognize, you know, as familiar as uh, Ronald McDonald and Tony the Tiger and, um, you know, the, the California Raisins. I'm getting, I don't know why they came to my mind right now, right? But what this means is that much, uh, you know, much public expectation in improvement in one's life, improvement in the quality of life for everyone lies not in the state, but in private enterprise, which will oftentimes replace the state or even better be supported by the state through political actors who now are little more than lobbyists for corporate interests um, and private initiatives. And this is where we're going to get to when we look at the, you know, the, the absolute catastrophic fallouts uh, in places like Flint, Michigan, where you might think to yourself that you know, the poisoning of the water has a lot to do with just horrible politicians, and that might be the state's fault. No, the state has effectively yielded. Um, you know, most of its public infrastructure and its safety regulations to lobbyists and private enterprise for the sake of making these industries and corporations, you know, operate with reckless abandon without having to worry about any kind of tax repercussion um, or you know, legal ramifications. You know, so rivers can be polluted. Um, sea lanes can be blocked, you know, BP can spill oil, you know, once every, you know, couple of years. Pharmaceutical companies can charge an arm and a leg for medicine. Um, and in, in a way, you kind of look at the, you know, just vast degrees of greed in the country today, and you think to yourself, someone should put a stop to this. The problem is, is that what many of these companies are doing are actually legal because the regulations have been rolled back. So, you know, politicians have basically allowed uh, these companies, these factories, these firms, these corporations to just kind of get away with whatever they want to get away with in pursuit of profits, right? In pursuit of the market. A lot of this, and I don't want to say that this is exclusive, but much of this is drawn from the writings, the theories of Milton Friedman. 
Um, now, Friedman is, uh, was a very controversial individual, right? He, he has his fans, uh, particularly among, you know, libertarians, uh, free market advocates, um, and ANCAPs online. Um, but he's also widely derided um, by the left, especially among, you know, democratic socialists, um, as really one of the most dangerous and altogether bad economists, you know, of the 20th century. Um, much of his writings, um, and, and again, I, I recommend people read his work, Capitalism and Freedom, because it's one of those monumental pieces of literature that just kind of takes the world by storm um, at the right place at the right time, right? He, he's writing um, in a period when state regulatory policies are still very much in play. Unions are still very strong. And the quality of life in the United States is in that, you know, beautiful boomer golden age that, um, you know, old uh, conservatives will like to reminisce about. But Friedman is sort of thinking at the time that the productivity of the United States could be even better if all of these regulations and safety nets and protectionist policies and, you know, and, 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 and union strikes could just simply be eliminated, right? So he's kind of like somebody who was reminiscing about, you know, the Gilded Age of the 1920s when, you know, railroad barons and oil executives just kind of could be free to do whatever they wanted, right? Um, and you might think to yourself now, especially in 2021, it's like, man, the guy was really getting nostalgic for some of the worst people out there. Um, but that's Milton Friedman. Um, Friedman's whole understanding of the fundamental aspects of capitalism being as unfettered, as unobstructed as possible, is one of the things that makes people who read him today really raise their eyebrows and think, well, where are you basing this off of? And again, I will admit, I'm you know much more of a detractor than a proponent of Friedman. Um, much of his arguments in the book, and again, I recommend reading it, are based on a dude, trust me policy. <laughs> you know, he doesn't really have um, any historical evidence to back up his points. He just simply says what could be if we get rid of the state um, providing for welfare and security for the weakest members of the group, right? If we put money and power in the strongest, that would galvanize this, you know, the society even better. And boy, was he wrong, right? So, you know, I, I'm gonna, you know, kind of you know, dunk on Friedman today because many of the policies and the problems that we have in the U.S. today, which of course has led to political radicalization are, you know, drawn from his writings, drawn from his influential speeches uh, from, the, from the 50s and 60s. So, all right, what does this guy think? Like, what, you know, what, what are his beliefs, his assumptions? And, that, and, I, and I deliberately say assumptions because, as I've indicated, much of his work is based on um, hope, more on optimistic suspicion, really, than anything else. But there's three things, right? Three things we, we, we can draw from here. The first one is probably the least problematic. And that is capitalism is a fundamentally democratic vocation. Um, it's not entirely true, considering that capitalism requires the existence of inequality. It requires the existence of unemployment and poverty. But hear me out here. He makes the argument that capitalism is a democratic vocation in the sense that a free market indicates the existence of an independent and free middle class, right? So this is your entrepreneurial society, your early modern bourgeoisie, um, and a group of individuals who are large enough to be somehow untethered um, from the snares of a pre-modern, early modern, uh, elite-driven uh, state, uh, as well as being free from being the willing pawns of, you know, state corporatism, All right? So, you know, the early, um, you know, economic entrepreneurs um, are those that benefit from a society in which power is limited at the top, right? Which kind of allows them to, you know, pursue their own economic interests. Now, of course, this presupposes that many of these individuals are democratic. Um, you know, some of the big um, economic entrepreneurs of this country were 
absolute cutthroat individuals that wanted to hoard as much money for themselves as possible. And you know, there wasn't a labor strike that they didn't want to order the National Guard to fire into the crowd here. But, you know, hear me out here. The middle class, um, which is really the group that Friedman is ultimately referring to, um, are people who are driven by pursuits in economic pro productivity and well-being. And that is going to create the environment in which a democratic system will function, right? The middle class wants um, the state to not take, you know, uh, you know their hard-earned money for other purposes. They will use their wealth, which is generated, not inherited, and they will put that into investing in a political system that allows for um, the entrepreneur, the worker, to you know keep their earnings um, as much as possible and decide where they want to allocate their taxes to. Right? Friedman is not saying get rid of taxes, um, but what he is saying is that taxes should be allocated towards certain enterprises and you know not others. So with that in mind, his understanding of the state. Now here's where things get a little bit more controversial is that state regulation of a free market hinders innovation and development while stifling individual freedoms. Now, we might be able to accept the first part of this, right? State regulation of a free market might hinder innovation and development. Sure, um, the state will in all likelihood prevent certain companies and firms from engaging in what could be um, a number of unethical or unlawful practices for the pursuit of profit. Um, the state may um, require um, companies and firms to operate within a certain legal and ethical uh, framework of conduct. That much is also certain. But to suggest that state regulation stifles individual freedoms really implies how you think of these freedoms. Um, and in Friedman's sense, right, he understands democracy not as the collective rights of the group, which is what early modern democracy presupposes, but more so the individual rights of the citizen, right? So it's really within Friedman's writings, among others, but we'll stick with Friedman right now, in which individualization is about as important as the fundamental activities of the free market. Okay? So individual freedoms are stifled insofar as personal freedoms, personal rights are not being um, allowed to you know, reach their normal you know, logical conclusions. Okay? Now, why is Friedman so anti-state? Um, there's a number of reasons, right? Chief of which is he's writing this during the, you know, the Cold War, the height of the Cold War. So what is the um, ideological antithesis to market capitalism? And that's socialism, but more specifically, state-sponsored socialism. Not just of the Soviet Union, but also, you got to remember, is the 50s and the 60s, unions are still very much active. Um, there are still very, you know, powerful and prominent labor movements within the United States, right? And this is just normal for an industrializing economy. This is not some kind of um, unconventional byproduct, right? The more industrialized a country is, the more likely their unions are going to exist, uh, especially with the presence of skilled labor. Friedman kind of looks at this and says, well, this is just antithetical to the entire system because these are individuals that are not um, interested in individual empowerment as they are collective rights. So, you know, socialism in this sense, um, you know, particularly the labor laws, the union policies, the, you know, the, the, the prevalency of the AFL and CIO and the Teamsters and others, right? These are all groups that advocate economic planning and regulation. Now, he never goes into the specifics about what regulation and planning does or doesn't. But he wants you to believe that this just gets in the way of the entrepreneurial idea of what the firm, the company can in fact do. And therefore just, you know, circles back on the reader by saying this is just an attack on personal freedoms and individuality, right? It prevents the person from achieving their, you know, ultimate set of personal choices um, and freedoms. Now, of course, 
as he's writing um, in the 50s and 60s, right? The Soviet Union, China, Cuba, right? All that stuff is there. But he oftentimes will lump socialism with the type of bureaucratic state planning that is reminiscent of Czechoslovakia, Romania, the Soviet Union, and others, right? So he, he kind of begins this very simple sleight of hand lumping that any um, criticism of and opposition to the free market must come from agents of the Soviet Union. And any kind of promotion of state regulatory policies, right, even those that go towards the, the, you know, the health of one's workers, um, you know, is not only an attack on individual freedoms, but, he says, and this is where he makes that jump, that attack on individual freedoms is thoroughly un-American. That is what uh, the United States was not founded on. That is Marxism. That's socialism. That's stuff that has no place in American values, which is the reason why he's a big fan of the Gilded Age of the 1920s and, to a lesser extent, the 1880s and the 1890s, when capitalism was allowed to operate with reckless abandon, but, of course, he's living decades later, so he doesn't have to experience the residual offshoots of that. But he argues that, you know, the people like Cornelius Vanderbilt and Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan and, you know, these and the Rockefellers, I mean, these are people that all he has to do is just mention their names, and the readers will just remember them in some symbolic narrative way. These are individuals that got rich, they use their wealth to the betterment of society, perhaps maybe, right? They're the ones that laid the tracks uh, of railroad. They're the ones that created the steel skeletal frameworks of buildings in New York and Chicago, right? Not the state, right? But private enterprise. Now, you know, mind you, let's not, you know, talk about the workers, um, who felt the need to unionize and radicalize in response to that, that's, that's inconsequential as far as Friedman's concerned, right? He's more interested in C. Montgomery Burns, uh, you know, less uh, Homer Simpson. So in this sense, the assumptions show his deep distrust of the state. This is another thing you've got to sort of take on faith with him. And most of the time when he's arguing this, he, it falls into the dude, trust me, I know that this sounds weird, but hear me out. According to Friedman, the state regulates, routinizes, and controls. Okay. No, no one's going to argue against that. That's the role of the state. The state possesses a monopoly on authority, sets the laws, regulates policy, and we would like to think within um, a collection of moral democratic sentiments does so for the collective benefit of as many people as possible. Right? Hence the reason why the state will tax use the tax resources to fund and invest in public welfare, um, you know, social health care, public transportation. These are things that Friedman looks at and says, these are attacks on personal freedoms, right? Investing in public transportation will prevent me from choosing to buy an automobile, right? I should be able to decide where and when I want. And if I own an automobile, why should I pay taxes to something I don't use, right? Why should I pay taxes to a public transportation system that I do not use myself? That's an attack on my personal freedoms. That is a taxation of something that I don't benefit from, right? And as a result, right, this continued sense of taxation, the pervasiveness of the state will serve as instruments of stagnation, uniformity, and mediocrity, right? So his his big prediction, which he kind of, you know, has sort of an I told you so moment in the 80s, was as the state continues to provide for a um, adequate uh, standard of living for everybody, right? There's going to be, you know, a taxation system that's going to fund all of that. Eventually what's going to happen is a floor of living is going to be achieved, and in order to improve that, taxes either have to go up or people are going to have to make do with less, right? And, you know, at some point we kind of achieve an equilibrium, which, you know, according to, let's say, socialism or social democracy, well, great, this is exactly what, it's, what it is now, right? Enjoy. Like, everybody has food, shelter, public transportation, clean drinking water, adequate education. For Friedman, this is now plateaued. He's saying we can do more, we can do better, and the state is preventing that from happening. Hence, the state being an antithesis 
to freedom and especially liberty. The state, he argues, might be good in the initial period in uplifting the quality of life of people. But at some point, right, the state is going to produce diminishing returns. And the state will make the argument that it is doing so for ensuring everybody having some modicum of living. But according to Friedman, and this is another one of those dude trust me arguments, is that by making certain that the slowest, the weakest, and the you know and and the le and the least smart have benefits, that is preventing the fastest, the most innovative, and the most intelligent from achieving their peak degrees of prosperity. So therefore, argues Friedman, by working to ensure everything for everybody. The state ultimately ensures nothing for nobody. Again, you got to figure out how he's thinking because he's not basing this on any real empirical evidence. But he's saying that let's say this modicum of living has been achieved, the lower classes, he argues, will just become lazy and compliant. Right? They'll be able to live off of the welfare state. They'll be able to live off of subsidies from more harder working uh, Americans, whether they are the working class or the managerial class. And knowing, right, Friedman argues, that these lower classes will, you know, kind of fall into the stereotypical, you know, welfare moochers and uh, unemployment bums, the upper classes are going to be disenfranchised from working beyond whatever mandates that they have, right? They're going to just fulfill their quotas, they're not going to do any more, and what could be innovative research what could be, you know, forward-thinking, dynamic um, creativity is going to get lost, right? Because we fulfill our quotas, it's now the weekend, that's all that I want, right? So Friedman is, you, know, you can kind of see how he's making the argument that innovation kind of happens during times of crises and a little bit of fear that one might go bankrupt or homeless, you know, it's adapt or die, um, advance, or just remain complacent. But the problem with Friedman's argument is that he tends to um, dismiss too much the benefits that the state provides to ordinary Americans, or anybody for that matter, British, Germans, Italians, whatever, who just simply want to live a simple life, you know, make enough of a living, have a house, send their kids to school, hopefully have their kids go to school to learn something else, and not have to worry about you know, financial problems, uh, or just the future in general. Friedman says this stuff makes Americans complacent. It makes them lazy. No, we need to kind of put the fear of Darwinism in their heads. And that will separate, you know, the entrepreneurs from the lazy cogs who just simply choose to be poor, right? So the narrative of neoliberalism that Friedman, um, Friedrich Hayek, uh, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, um, you know, others like them, right, both, you know, economists as well as politicians ascribe to, um, really, you know, fall into a few important bullet points that we need to identify before we move forward. Number one, the freer the economy, the freer the politics. And by that extension, the freer the politics, the freer the people, right? You see how one leads to the other. So whether you see this or not, whether you agree with this or not, Friedman is just basically writing this multiple times in his work, again, based on, dude, trust me, right? Just, I know what I'm talking about, just hear me out. The freer the economy, the freer the politics. And the freer the politics, the freer the people. Thus, the state needs to be limited to fulfilling only basic functions of security, law, and order. The state should not have any say in economic regulation, management, or planning, right? All of these responsibilities. In fact, if Friedman got his way, it would be environmental protection, national parks, oceans, rivers, wildlife, clean air, the environment. You just like privatize everything. All of that should be in the hands of free market entrepreneurs who, he argues, as free people, if we go to the previous one, if they're free people because the politics are free and the economy is free, are going to advocate for continued free politics thanks to free economics. You know, you got to, it's like, it's, this is kind of like, you know, that freshman kid who didn't read half the stuff in Intro to Economics, but is trying to wiggle his way through the final exam. And again, it's all based on, you know, dude, hear me out. You know, whereas history proves 
otherwise. But, you know, again, we're only about halfway through. The third uh, narrative, the third element of this economic narrative is that freedom and liberty are measured through degrees of individual self-worth and accomplishment, right? Liberty and freedom are not measured by the amount of public services that are available. Or if I get sick, um, what is going to, what are my options at the hospital, right? No, that's, that's not what it is. Freedom and liberty are the amount of money that you have, the amount of capital that you have. That is where self-worth and accomplishment comes, right? The more money you have, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what happens when you get sick. You're going to be able to pay for it. You're going to be able to, you know, handle whatever problems that you have because money solves all problems. And if it doesn't, you just don't have enough money. Work harder and get more. Come back and see me, you know, next time. So while many of these individuals existed after Friedman's time, right, modern day, you know, internet libertarians and ANCAPs and people who advocate for, you know, people who believe that taxation is theft, yada, yada, um, are those who emulate people like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, definitely, uh, Richard Branson, you know, I mean, these are people who become, you know, grotesquely rich, um, off of being allowed to run their company in however way that they want. And of course, the understanding among fans of them are that anyone that doesn't like the conditions in their companies are free to leave. Bezos is not shackling you to uh, the distribution center, well, at least not yet. You know? So if you work there, then you obviously agree to these policies. Um, but it's interesting to point out, you know, Bezos, Musk, Branson, you know, Gates is a little bit different. I mean, he's got, you know, he, he's, he is kind of moving more into that, you know, philanthropic mindset here. <clears throat> but none of the others really care about social welfare. You know, they, they, they really care about just empowering, expanding, and enriching uh, their own companies for their own sense of self-worth. So the final element of this narrative Right, is that if we emulate people like Bezos, Musk, and Branson, state regulation and protectionism um, not only inhibits growth and prosperity, but um, will contribute to recessions and unemployment. Again, there's no um, you know, tangible evidence beyond you know, interpretations that exist here. Um, but what is clear is that proponents of neoliberalism from an economic standpoint um, are anti-labor, anti-union, anti-protectionism, anti-regulatory, and altogether anti-Marxist, because all of those things um, fall into, you know, sort of the yin-yang category of economics. There's either capitalism or there's socialism. And if these things are inhibiting capital, well, then they have to be socialist, which, if you want to add an element of patriotism to this, is, as we've just said before, take it on faith, thoroughly un-American, right? So if you want, you know, affordable dental, you know, go back to Russia, comrade, you know, because, you know, your affordable dental is going to prevent the Russians from being the next innovators in, I don't know, automobiles or televisions or gadgets or whatever it is, right? Yeah, you'll have, you know, good teeth, but, you know, who gets excited? Who gets excited over healthcare? You know, it's like, you know, I, I've been to a number of doctor's offices where they've got these things, and I don't know who does this, but these doctor's offices have like, we sell gift certificates, you know, makes a great gift, right? And now can you imagine, you know, opening up a Christmas gift and getting a $100 gift certificate to your local dentist? You know, it's like, all right, this is what is one of those boring gifts. You know, who wants, who wants that, right? And well, hey, if you got bad teeth and you need someone to take a look at it, yeah, sure, why not? But no, 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 we want toys, we want gadgets, we want all that kind of stuff. Where does that stuff come from? comes from the United States, doesn't come from Russia, doesn't come from socialist countries, right? You know what comes from those places? You know, immigrants looking for a better life, argues neoliberalism. Okay? Now, that's the argument. That's the belief. You know, Friedman can kind of get away with writing this stuff a little bit in the 1960s, where, you know, he didn't really have a chance to address the problems of the late 80s. You know, he dies before this stuff really happens, but... When his policies are put into practice, we begin to see the consequences of free market omnipresence. What do we see? The first thing that we notice is that politics has now become almost entirely profit-driven. 
Um, there are, you know, a majority of politicians today, both Republicans and Democrats, that advocate stripping government of its civic functions, exacerbating existing socioeconomic inequalities, and removing social safety fail-safes of a welfare system that allows for competitive capitalism to be as malicious as it is lethal. So in other words, by allowing the state to deregulate in favor of free market enterprise, we are not actually better off, but we're worse than we were beforehand. When profit continues to prove more important over social welfare, this gives us an understanding of why social services are defunded and deregulated. Infrastructure is privatized and public health is commodified. The idea is that if we can make a buck off of anything, it's going to happen. And those with the financial means won't have any problems. Those that don't are suddenly going to find new obstacles, new challenges, and new problems that they previously did not have to worry about. And so what we, you know, see as, you know, recent as the late 90s, the 2000s, especially by, you know, the 2008 economic crisis, is that, you know, Friedman's emphasis on state deregulation and allowing the market to solve everything, um, you know, he fails to account for really two things. You know, two fundamental things, which, you know, if you read it now, you could be like, well, duh, I could have told you this. The first is private enterprise has not bought up public services, right? Buses, public housing, public education, infrastructure, they all remain the, you know, vocation. They all remain, you know, under state funding. But if the state has now lowered taxes and cut spending to these services, um, in the name of lowering taxes or providing, uh, you know, investment opportunities for other things, well, then the infrastructure is going to collapse, right? Because, you know, the Richard Bransons, the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, they're not taking over any of these things, right? They're not, you know, you know Jeff Bezos is not buying um, universities that are struggling. You know, Elon Musk is not, doesn't care um, about, um, you know, a, a failing, um, you know, sewage system in Flint, Michigan. No, he's interested in launching one of his cars into space. You want to know why? The other reason, free market entrepreneurs are not interested in social welfare. Contrary to what Friedman wants you to believe, that by eliminating the necessity and the obligation of tax, entrepreneurs will, through the generosity of their own hearts, give money anyway. Right? But they're going to give it to places where they think are useful, which according to Friedman would be better than the state allocating it to places that should you know, just be economically starved. Here's the problem with that. Philanthropy does exist. Right? Billionaires, millionaires, they give money all the time. I mean, even in the Gilded Age, right? the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Morgans, they all gave money. Hence the reason why we have things like Carnegie Hall, um, Rockefeller Center, you know, they like to leave these public legacies so people generations later can remember their names and say, wow, they were great people, other than the people who remembered them at the time as absolute assholes. I mean, probably the most honest of all of those was Cornelius Vanderbilt, who openly and unapologetically said he's not giving his money to the poor. In many cases, he was like, fuck the poor. My money, I do what I want with it. I mean, that's basically what these modern-day entrepreneurs will do. Does Elon Musk have the money to redo the water system of Flint, Michigan? Of course he does. Is he going to do it? Absolutely not. Does Jeff Bezos have enough money to provide health care for all of his workers that's even more comprehensive than what you'd find in Scandinavia? Absolutely. Is he going to do it? Why not? Why would he do it? Of course he's not going to do it. Okay? So the problem is, is that these entrepreneurs are not interested in public welfare. That's, that, for them, that's just wasting money away. For them, they use their money as a way of leveraging their company 
against bidding, you know, in bidding wars with locations around the country and around the world over who is going to underbid each other enough to get the next Amazon distribution center open. Right? This happened um, about two, three years ago here in New York City. If you, some of you might remember, right? There was this uh, very close idea that. Um, Long, a, a part of Long Island City would be given over to Jeff Bezos to create this major um, Amazon hub. And, you know, de Blasio and Cuomo and, every, and Bloomberg were ready to basically cede sovereignty over, like, a portion of Queens to Jeff Bezos. Like, literally tell him, we will pay you hundreds of millions of dollars rather than Bezos paying anything. But now it's the point where the city, the state, will literally pay people like Bezos to set up shop here with, you know, enormous tax breaks, tax incentives, corporate loopholes. I mean, you can only imagine what was offered to Bezos um, as a way of getting him to put Queens on the final list of three. Until, right, others, one of them being AOC, right, noted the absolute catastrophic consequences that would happen if this were to take place. Um, New York does not have the infrastructure, it does not have the, uh, you know, the adequate public transportation for what this would require. In addition, it would probably result in the gentrification of areas that, yes, look good for people moving there, right? People whose children are named Mackenzie and, you know, Campbell, you know. But for the locals that live, they would be priced out of their neighborhoods, right? So it would just simply further the impoverishment of some at the enrichment of others. This is what we call race to the bottom conditions, right? So these major companies today are unrestricted in what they can demand and what they can expect. From, you know, a week or two ago, we read in Frank's work, What's the Matter with Kansas, um, how Boeing could basically threaten to pull out of, you know, areas of the state in, you know, with the assumption that they could get a better deal elsewhere. And what does local government do? Find out what the deal is that they're being offered and even underbid them. So what does that do? Less taxes, less regulation, less social safety nets, whatever it takes to get them to stay. This is what, this, this is what happens when corporate sovereignty takes place. The state now becomes the subordinate actor to these corporate entities. Very different from what Friedman wanted you to believe. And look, the facts are clear. We have 40 years of receipts that show financial self-interest, not financial philanthropy, coupled with rising debt, the outsourcing of jobs and industries, increases in the standards of living amid the stagnation of wages, right? Increase in the cost of the standard of living, amid the stagnation of wages. Federal minimum wage has been $7.25 now for years. The cost of living has gone up tremendously. One cannot live on minimum salary alone. And any indication of reimposing, reestablishing state-funded or state-supported initiatives are going to be stigmatized as wasteful spending, government intrusion, assaults on liberty, and, you know, just altogether, you know, foreign socialist elements. And we see this in the healthcare sector, the ongoing debate around gun regulation, tax codes, right? The last 40 years has seen an unraveling of these social safety nets, these social welfare policies, these regulatory, um, you know, safety policies that have led to a deterioration, not an increase in the quality of life, an increase in the mortality rate, a decrease in the age of living. People are getting sicker, they're getting poorer, and they're getting angrier. And all of this has much to do with the free market fundamentalism that Milton Friedman advocated, but has been in place politically since Reagan and continued under Bush the Elder, made far more culturally woke under Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, continued under Donald Trump, and defended and upheld by Joe Biden. Right? So are there personal consequences to neoliberalism? There are many. Right? The first is, well, it's built right into the theory. The atomization of society in the name of individual self-improvement and advancement. Now, this is something that is 
somewhat controversial to note because we kind of take it on faith that democracy in America is, right, the empowerment of the individual, right? The, 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 the individual rights of the citizen is something that we just assume to be inalienable. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if the individual rights come at the direct consequence of the collective rights of the group, then there is no incentive for individuals to work together, right? Civil society becomes atomized. Community development becomes, um, you know, um, loose and disconnected. And when problems in, you know, economic or political matters arise, no one knows how to organize. No one knows how to cooperate. Everyone kind of thinks on their own, and it really is individual survival mode, right? Hence the reason why, right, the poor and working classes become the most victimized because they have little to no financial security to rely on. So what ends up happening is that these atomized groups are reorganized by you know, opportunistic political elites, and this is especially uh, white rural America, into competing racial segments. This is one of the reasons why the great backlash narrative carries such a degree of resonance among people who live in those areas who are directly targeted by those narratives. Now, before we get to the whites, the people of color, specifically the blacks, are almost entirely disposed of. Um, you know, they default to voting for and supporting the Democratic Party, um, but the Democratic Party is equally complacent, equally complicit is a better word, um, in disenfranchising the poor and working classes, right? We look at how Detroit deteriorated. We look at the poisoning of the water in Flint. Mind you, Michigan has a Republican governor that was responsible for all of this. But blacks and other people of color who have little political mobility, connections, clout, um, they're just simply discarded, right? They're just overlooked for the sake of the health of a market that increasingly survives by siphoning money, resources, and energy away from other sectors. Like it, re it really is a leech more than an incubator. Um, and this is actually used rather poignantly um, against poor whites. So whereas blacks are disposed of, whites are exploited. Right? The poor white working communities who are just as you know, vulnerable as their black and brown colleagues are presented in such a way as the decline of the American way of life is tantamount to an assault on traditional American values. And again, you, you got to kind of make that mental leap to go from point A to point B here, right? So it really is, you know, more of the, you know, socio-cultural elements of neoliberalism that, um, you know, calls for diversity, inclusion, um, you know, help and assistance to the most vulnerable, who tend to most of the time be stereotyped, right, <clears throat> as immigrants or people of color. Hence the opposition that many whites have to the Affordable Care Act or socialized medicine in general, right? People would say that they would rather, you know, die younger than know that socialized medicine is going to help some illegal immigrant. And, you know, you might think to yourself that could be unbelievably racist among many whites, but it could also be an indication of just how nihilistic poor whites are as well, where there might be a thinking, I might die in my 50s, but I'm poor and I have nothing to live for. So why would I want to be poor and have nothing to live for for another 10, 20 years if my lot in life is not going to get any better? Might as well go out now and enjoy, you know, enjoy life while I still have all my marbles in my head. That also kind of shows the deterioration of the quality of life. When whites are actually able to say, you know what, I'm fucked, I'm done, it's, you know, this is what it is. Um, why should I have other people benefit from something? Hence the opposition to healthcare, the opposition to increased tax codes, the opposition to um, gun regulations, because all of these are now somehow seen as, again, a tax on American values, individual freedoms. I don't know what these individual freedoms do for these people, but it's enough to get them to support one candidate over the other. Um, and while this is happening, of course, you know, democracy is broken down, you know, either by 
privatized corporate interests that have now taken over the responsibility of what the state should do, but just don't care. So there's nothing to be taken care of at all. Or, more likely, political leadership um, is transformed into this unholy cadre of predatory oligarchs who are more interested in meeting the demands and the expectations of their corporate donors than their own electorates. So the state isn't necessarily withdrawn. The state isn't necessarily deregulated. The state is now regulating a policy of deregulation. The state is actively working behind the scenes to empower and mobilize these corporate interests who are also being told, look, pollute all you want, right? Violate labor laws all you want. We'll, we won't prosecute you. We'll give you tax codes. It's great. We just don't want you to move out of our area right now. And you know what? We'll even change the laws when no one's looking. So when you are sued, the worst thing that could ever happen is that you got to pay a couple of million dollars in reparations, but you make over a billion a year anyway. So this is a slap on the wrist. No one's going to go to jail. No one's going to get fired over it. And if they do, you know, it'll be one of those, uh, you know, forced retirements. But you're still going to get your retirement package. You're still going to get your bonuses, right? None of you are going to be homeless, right? Once you're rich, you're going to stay rich. There's nothing that is going to prevent you from being unrich, right? There's, you know, so in that sense, you know, politicians are now in the hands of neoliberal entrepreneurs, which gives us really now um, a way of understanding um, you know, just what exactly happened and how it happened in Flint, Michigan, which, you know, I'm looking at the clock here and I see that I'm almost an hour and 15 in. And you know what? I think I'm going to break this lecture up into two parts uh, just because I don't want to overwhelm the listener with what's probably going to be about two hours worth of material. So I think what I'm going to do is I will stop here and use everything that I've talked to up until now as a standalone identification for what neoliberalism um, thinks that it is versus what it actually produces. And then we'll continue uh, directly in a second lecture um, examining the residual effects of neoliberalism in Michigan, um, Kansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, and elsewhere. Right? So stay tuned. Uh, we'll get to part two in looking at these examples right away.